Well, hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you are able to join us today. This is for the trucking safety and regulatory requirements. My name is Melanda Heinkel, and I will be the moderator uh, for today's workshop. Uh, just a quick little intro about myself. I work in uh, compliance for the North Central region of the state of Wisconsin. Um, and our presenter, William Berger, uh, who's going to be going over the information for today's workshop, um, has provided statewide program oversight and works closely with the motor carrier industry with the implementation of new regulations. In addition, he works closely with Wisconsin DOT engineers with the design of size weight enforcement facilities and bringing those facilities online. In addition to uh, being a member of uh, numerous committees. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Q&A chat box, and I will go through those once we get towards the end of the session. I will also include a link to workshop survey once we get close to the end of the session, if you are able to uh, fill that out afterwards. Um, so without further ado, uh, we will turn this over to William and uh, he start on his presentation. All right, well, thank you and uh, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, able to talk to you today. I know at State Patrol, we certainly are, are very pleased whenever we have the opportunity to um, educate the industry on laws and regulations and uh, we're just uh, happy to be here. So with that being said, we do have a lot of information to go over in a relatively short time. So we will jump right in and get started. Um, basically, we'll start off, why are we here? Just for that training, education. Um, we have an outreach uh, program within the State Patrol uh, for this type of thing. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to the industry to uh, pass on the laws and regulations to them so we can obtain uh, foremost voluntary compliance. Um, and with the overall um, reason to decrease crashes, um, hopefully uh, eliminate some complaints that the public has against uh, trucking um, companies and motor carriers. We wanna increase safety and also uh, protect our roadway infrastructure. Uh, State Patrol does uh, present probably at least 50 educational seminars each year to motor carriers. Um, it is something that is available for the industry to reach out to their local State Patrol regional office and request a safety presentation at their facility or some third uh, party venue. Um, we do try to like to uh, present at those events when there's at least 50 people there. Um, in a lot of cases, the uh, multiple motor carriers or companies will pool their employees together if they're smaller carriers to um, you know make it worthwhile to, to get to that number. Um, the one thing that you're going to see throughout the presentation today is uh, on the screen you'll see a motor carrier information line phone number and I'd encourage you to jot that number down keep it handy. That's a number that is available um, all the time and it's specifically there for you. Uh, for the industry to call that motor carrier information line and ask a question. Uh, the way that's set up is you have, um, you'll make a phone call to that number, you'll leave a message on a recorder, and somebody will return your call within two hours with an answer. <clears throat> if they, um, you know, need to do a little bit more research, um, they'll, they'll call you back, they'll keep you in the loop that they received it and so forth, but uh, typically is a two hour turnaround time. But uh, feel free to use that and share that number with, with some of your partners. Today, what we're going to be talking about um, four main areas, uh, pre-trip, post-trip inspections, CDL requirements, size, weight, and operating authority. As far as the pre-trip inspection and post-trip inspection requirements, uh, that does have to be in writing. It needs to be completed at the end of each work day and it needs to cover the following uh, parts of the vehicle. Uh, basically, um, it's, it's gonna be a very thorough walk around inspection. Um, 
main things, obviously, brakes, steering components, lights, um, tires, horns, all that type of thing for safety equipment um, would be all those things that you're going to, to check. If you have a tractor and trailer unit or a truck and trailer, you would, the driver would complete just one inspection report that would cover that towed vehicle. And if you, for some reason, a driver were to have to operate two different vehicles within the same day, that driver is required to complete the pre-trip inspections for each vehicle. Probably uh, this is something that will not affect uh, this group much at all, but um, I'll state it anyway that if you were to have two, two drivers uh, within that same power unit where they take turns or, or switch off, something like that, only one driver needs to sign the inspection reports. And then something that changed back in, in 2014, I have a new regulation, but it's not so new any, anymore. It's been back in 2014. There was a change in regards to the daily inspection reports. And it basically said that if you complete the inspection report and there's no defects, then you do not need to complete a report in writing. So you'd only write, uh, write up that report if there's a defect located. Now, what that means is that if you do the, the driver does the post-trip inspection and they find something wrong, they need to still write that down. They can't just um, yell out to the mechanic, hey, you know, we got a headlight uh, uh, broken here uh, or doesn't work, so could you fix it quick? And then they don't complete that inspection report because it's gonna be fixed right away. It does need to be written down. If any defects are located during that, the inspections, then those defects should be corrected prior to being redispatched. Um, and then every motor carrier uh, has to certify that those defects were repaired on the original inspection report. The um, Pre-trip inspection is going to be, um, before driving the vehicle, the driver is going to be satisfied that the vehicle is in safe operating condition. They're going to look at the last driver's vehicle inspection report from the post-trip inspection. And then they're going to sign that report only if the defects that were noted on the post-trip inspection were repaired um, prior to the pre-trip that the driver is now working on. There is a possibility that the repair wasn't made, but then there'll be a certification section <clears throat> that will be signed by either the mechanic or the um, safety official with the company that stated that it was fixed or that is not a significant safety item and it can be operated without uh, being repaired. Um, I'd caution you that there's not many things, if any, that that uh, they can sign off and, and state that, you know, it's, it's not a safety item. Um, but if there is something like that, that is a possibility. But uh, generally, uh, that's not going to be the case and any defects would be repaired prior to operation and that certification line uh, would be completed. If a post-trip inspection was done, uh, which included a tractor and, and a trailer or truck and trailer, but during the pre-trip inspection, that trailer is no longer part of that combination, then that would be a case where um, Obviously, the driver does not need to complete a pre-trip on that trailer um, when it's not part of that new unit for that day's operation. Uh, if that's the case, what I probably would do, though, is have your driver just make a simple note on there that shows that the trailer is no longer attached to the vehicle and no inspection was done, something just real simple note that way. So just a, a little bit of a summary on the pre-trip and post-trip inspection. Um, the main inspection is at the end of the day. So that's when the driver would, would operate throughout the day. They're in a rough construction area and you know a lot of rough work being done and perhaps some wires get tore off of the taillights on the box or something like that. <clears throat> so then they get back at the end of the day to the shop and they're going to complete the post-trip inspection. That's the main inspection of the day. 
So that driver is going to grab a new inspection sheet and do their main inspection and write down perhaps, you know, left turn signal inoperative. So now in the morning, when that new driver comes in, they're going to grab that inspection report from last night from that other driver on the post trip, and they're going to look at that report. And they're going to see, oh, that, you know, the turn signal wasn't working. And the driver signed off on it from the post trip. There'll be a second signature line that will be the certification line, and that's for the mechanic or company official to say, hey, that turn signal was fixed, um, you know, so it's good. Then there's going to be a third line for that new driver in the morning now doing the pre-trip inspection using the old post-trip inspection report from the day before that will have a signature line for them that basically states, hey, um, you know, I looked at it. It was certified that it was fixed. I did my pre-trip inspection and I didn't find any other defects and the vehicle appears to be in safe operating condition. They sign it and off they go for the day's work. And at the end of the day, that uh, driver would then start the process all over with the post-trip inspection, grabbing a new form and uh, completing the inspection report if there's defects located. A uh, big misconception on that in the industry um, that most drivers want to do the main inspection in the morning. But if you think of it this way, at the end of the day, it gives you time to um, you know, have those off hours for a mechanic to make some repairs. Otherwise, you're going to have a driver come in in the morning to take off. Uh, they do their pre-trip inspection and now you, they find some defect going on, but um, you know who's gonna take time to fix that when you have you know, some operators and heavy equipment waiting for these truck drivers to get there on site. They're gonna just say, hey, fix it later, get going. We got you know all these guys lined up, so you gotta get that job site. So um, makes a little bit more sense if you can look at it from that standpoint. Um, moving on to, to uh, CDL requirements. Basically, CDLs for Wisconsin is found in Chapter 343 of the, of the state statutes, but um, a lot of the information in the state statute is driven from federal regulations. As far as who needs a CDL, basically, uh, we're looking at a weight over 26,000 pounds, and that's going to be determined by the gross vehicle weight rating of the vehicle, a gross combination weight rating, if you have a combination of vehicles, the actual weight or the registered weight. Outside of dealing with the weight requirements, if you have a vehicle where you're hauling any amount of placardable hazardous materials or you have a vehicle with seating capacity of 15 uh, people or more uh, with the driver, then that would require a CDL as well, regardless of the size of the vehicle. CDLs can only be issued um, basically one per person at the same time. So years ago, the old chauffeur's license, people could have a bad driving record in one state and they'd just go to another state and get another license and on and on. But those days are long gone and everything is tied together now um, electronically. So uh, only one CDL at a time per person and all the states will monitor those records when they move from state to state. So um, if you lose your CDL in one state, you're not going to be able to go and get another CDL somewhere else. Uh, in order to obtain a CDL after March of 2015, drivers are required to show proof of legal, legal status and um, then that would also require them to um, show that when they're removing a class endorsement or adding a restrictor or something like that if they had one prior to. In order to obtain a CDL, uh, you will have to be 21 years of age if you have a CDL and operate interstate uh, with no restrictions. Otherwise, you can get a CDL at 18 years old but you would be restricted to operating in, in Wisconsin only, intrastate operation only, and um, you would not be able to obtain a hazmat endorsement though in the state until you're 21. <clears throat> uh, 
when you uh, first go to obtain your, your CDL, you're gonna have to pass a knowledge test and a driving skills test. Those knowledge tests, those are done at the local DMV office. You simply go in there and, and take the online uh, test at one of their computer stations. Once you obtain your, your, uh, your um, temporary CDL or your driving permit, then uh, what you would do is once you're ready for that driving skills test to actually test on the road um, or your inspection test, that's all done by third party testers or third party vendors. That is not something that DOT does. One of the different uh, items related to a CDL relating to hazardous materials is that uh, you must be 21, which we previously discussed, but you will also be required to have a background check completed and also submit to fingerprint um, comparisons and tests. And same thing as, as the actual CDL is proof of citizenship or legal status is required. You do have to be 18 years of age to possess a, a commercial vehicle learner's permit. Um, so again, you have to be 18 in order to get that uh, test with a class D driver's license, which is what they would have for driving a, a passenger car type vehicle. I'm sure everybody is aware of the entry level driver training. <clears throat> this is something that was just effective. Um, actually, it shows February 2nd, but it was February 7th uh, of this year when that went into effect. And basically, um, if you're going to obtain a CDL for the first time, upgrade from a class B to a class A, or add a passenger school bus or hazmat endorsement, you would need to comply with those requirements for the entry level testing process or training process. When we're talking about CDLs, there's a couple different um, vehicle classifications that we, we refer to. So basically your class A is going to be your combination of vehicles. So that's going to be a truck uh, or truck, a truck with a trailer or a semi-tractor trailer combination. So at least two vehicles. Um, it's going to be operating in combination. The gross vehicle weight rating for the um, combination is going to be over 26,000. And then the big thing here is that that towed vehicle would have to be more than uh, 10,000 pounds. And that these again, their weight ratings, actual weights, registered or registered weights, or vehicle weight ratings. So a class A, that'd be you know, a good example here. It'd be like an end dump. Um, then we get to a class B vehicle. Your actual weight registered or registered weight um, or gross vehicle weight rating exceeds twenty six thousand pounds for the vehicle, single vehicle. And then it could be in combination, but in that case, the trailer would be 10,000 pounds or less. So just because you have a class B doesn't mean you could not pull a trailer. It just means you cannot pull a heavy trailer that is over 10,000 pounds. So this would be your typical, um, you know, class B type vehicle here, quad axle dump truck. It could also be a semi-tractor. Uh, without the semi-trailer on, it's not a combination until you put the trailer behind it. So a bobtail uh, semi-tractor would, would basically require a Class B license. Then we get into those passenger and hazmat placarding requirements. That would be considered a Class C CDL or a Class C vehicle. There's a lot of different endorsements for CDLs. Um, could be, um, you know, double bottoms or triples, hazardous materials, tank, school bus, hazmat, um, and tanker. That would be an X endorsement if you have both of those, um, if the states uh, use that type of uh, system. Otherwise, it'll all be listed separately. So if you believe that you have uh, a license to operate within these endorsements, they will be uh, displayed on your driver's license. You can always uh, check that way to make sure that. Uh, you are properly licensed for that type of vehicle. 
There's also a lot of common restrictions on CDLs. Um, in the case of that 18 year old intrastate only driver, um, that would be a K restriction. Um, if you don't have, uh, if you test uh, for a CDL, but your vehicle did not have air brakes, um, it'd be an L restriction and so on. Uh, that O uh, restriction, and that's getting to be somewhat common um, in the sense that if you take your test in a pickup and trailer, so a large truck and trailer, um, but more of the pickup type, so your one ton dually, stuff like that, you're going to have a restriction of no tractor trailer. So you can get a class A vehicle by testing in a pickup and trailer, but you're not going to be allowed to operate a tractor and semi trailer with that. Um, the other thing would be that E would be for no manual transmission, getting to be a lot of uh, automatic transmissions out there. If you test in a vehicle with an automatic transmission, you will be restricted to only vehicles with automatic transmission. So um, if you have drivers that are um, getting their first time CDLs, it really would be a, a good idea to try to stress to them to get their CDL in a um, combination vehicle with air brakes and a manual transmission, then there would not be an issue at any time for them to operate any type of vehicle in the fleet. Um, obviously, if you're, you're as an employer, you have a certain fleet and they're all, you know, all uh, um, hydraulic brakes and, and straight trucks with automatic transmissions, then there wouldn't be that problem to, to have your drivers go that simple route and get the CDL with those restrictions. But um, otherwise, it, it is nice for the driver to just get the whole um, the whole CDL where there's no restrictions on there. CDLs um, are regulated rather heavily just by the nature of the vehicles that um, these drivers will operate. And with that comes disqualifications. Um, so basically, when you are disqualified, you, you basically lose your CDL. It might be because of a suspension or revocation or, or withdrawal. Um, could be something related to a medical, anything like that would be a CDL disqualification. If you're convicted of certain offenses, it will lead to a disqualification. <clears throat> These offenses are referred to as a serious traffic offense. And basically, uh, driving 15 or more miles an hour over a speed limit. Uh, improper lane changes, following too close, being involved in a fatal crash where you had a, an at-fault violation, um, no CDL when you're driving a vehicle that requires a CDL, or you're driving a, C, a CMV and is not the proper class, so you have a class B, but you're driving a class A semi-unit. <clears throat> Those would be serious traffic offenses. Obviously, <clears throat> continuing with serious traffic offenses, you know, the OWI uh, would be serious, uh, leaving the scene of a crash, or you commit a felony while using a commercial motor vehicle. Those would all be serious traffic offenses. Uh, some of the common questions uh, get pretty regularly yet. Um, relating to CDLs and, and driving under the influence is basically if you get a drunk driving on an ATV, bicycle, snowmobile, uh, boat, anything like that, does it disqualify you from operating this on your um, CDL? And it does not. Not at this point. There's some talk of pending legislation about maybe tying all this stuff together, but um, currently there is nothing that uh, would would tie that. Uh, recreational vehicle to your CDL. If you're driving a car, but you have a CDL, but you're now driving a car, uh, what is the prohibited alcohol concentration level you're restricted to? And basically, it goes by the vehicle you're operating at the time, regardless of your license or license type. So if you're driving a passenger car, the prohibited alcohol concentration level is 0.08. But if you're driving a commercial motor vehicle, then uh, 0 0.04 is considered an OWI in the car, but or in the CMV. But remember, 
operating a commercial motor vehicle requires absolute sobriety. So you can't have any uh, amount of detectable alcohol in your system, nor can you possess alcohol in the vehicle when you're operating it if it's a commercial motor vehicle. <clears throat> Something else uh, related to CDL that's a little bit different than your uh, class D driver's license, and that is in regards to an occupational driver's license. If you get a drunk driving, you will not be able to get an occupational license to work while um, pulling a CDL. So you could get a, a occupational license in a passenger car and, and you know use that for work purposes, but you can never get an occupational for a CDL. So basically you get an OWI, you're going to lose your CDL for a year. Uh, also tied into CDLs is the, uh, the tier of operation. So when we're talking about tiers, uh, tier one is your, your typical over the road semi driver. It could be, you know, if you work the, near the, the border states, it could be, you know, some of your dump truck operators would be a tier one when they go across state lines and, and they have their medical card, uh, that would be the tier one. They're, they cross state lines. There's no exceptions for them, and they're required to have a medical card. A tier two is interstate operation, but for some reason, they are exempted from uh, certain items, and they do not need that medical certificate. Tier three would be, uh, basically, they stay in the state of Wisconsin, but they are required to have the Fed Med card. In a tier four is they stay in Wisconsin, but do not need the medical certificate. Some of the reasons you could needing the medical card or accepted operations would be school bus operations, even though there may be some other um, requirements to have a FedMed card, but it'd be outside the parameters of what we're talking about today. Um, it could be that you're working for a governmental agency. Those, um, those drivers are not required. Uh, to, to comply with those regulations, that they would be accepted from the uh, federal regulations in regards to this topic. If you operate a fire trucks or rescue vehicles, um, that again would be an exempted industry. Uh, there, as you can see, there gets to be you know quite a list of, of carved out specialty areas. Um, that would uh, qualify for that tier two or tier four. But generally um, in your operations with construction, uh, they, would, they would not apply. Uh, talking about uh, Wisconsin intrastate hours of service now. Uh, purpose of, of regulations in, in regards to hours of service, the purpose is simple, uh, prevent crashes due to fatigue. Um, a study um, here from NHTSA showed that one in 25 drivers report falling asleep while driving in the previous 30 days. I mean, that's, that's staggering. Um, In 2013, 800 deaths were related to, to were reported as being related to um, basically driving and falling asleep in some manner or, or being drowsy, which caused crashes. Um, but that's only uh, what's reported as. But realistically, is it was thought that as much to as 6,000 fatal crashes could occur because of a uh, driver being drowsy. The hours of service regulations are, are based off of Part 395 in the federal regulations, but more specifically for Wisconsin intrastate operation, uh, those rules uh, can be found in Wisconsin Transportation Code 327. Um, Wisconsin does allow for some longer driving times or regulations for intrastate operation only compared to what the federal uh, regulations allow for interstate operation. 
And then it should be noted that Wisconsin does not require ELDs to be used at this point. And we do have a short haul provision of 150 miles uh, for intrastate operation. <clears throat> so there's two methods to record your hours of service. One is that 150 air mile short haul exemption where um, basically you use a, a, a time record. The other is that you would use a record of duty status. For the short haul time card exemption, again, you have to stay within 150 miles of your normal reporting location and end your, your, your day where you started from. Um, this uh, website link here is a place where you can go and easily draw these radiuses out if that helps you. You can maybe uh, write that down quick or um, in the uploaded documents, if you have access to those, which I uploaded um, before this presentation started, there is a sheet of paper on there that has a lot of different links uh, on the internet for trucking related items. And that is one of those links, which I put in that um, document. So under the short haul exemption, you have to stay within 150 air miles of your work reporting location. You have to return within 12 hours and release from duty and you need 10 hours off between your shift. So you have to, the driver would need to keep a time record, shows their name, the date and time in and out, and the hours worked for the driver. And then they could not exceed 70 hours in seven days or 80 hours in eight days. If you have a record of duty status <clears throat> uh, for interstate operation, that can be one of two things. One is it could be the traditional record of duty status or, or log book that has the grid, or the other is a record of duty status as defined in trans 32705. And that basically says it's any record which shows a daily total off duty time, daily total on duty time, and the daily total driving time could be a record of duty status. So it could be um, kind of a time record that has a little bit more information than the actual time record that's allowed under the short haul exemption. When looking at a record of duty status on the on the different four categories, there's off duty sleeper berth, on duty driving time or on duty not driving. That'd be on your typical uh, grid. And on duty time is basically uh, going to be any time that's driving, inspecting, um, working in a terminal, loading, unloading, all those sorts of, sort of things. So for the Wisconsin hours of service regulations for drivers running a record of duty status, um, basically uh, no driver can drive after um, you know more than 12 hours following 10 hours off duty. They cannot drive uh, for a period of having been on duty for 16 hours following 10 hours off. Or we're back to that 70 hours in seven days or 80 hours in eight. <clears throat> so basically by, by using a record of duty status, it allows for a 16 hour day to be um, used by these drivers. No more than 12 hours of that um, can be for driving. The problem with the 16 hour day is that you still need 10 hours off before you can start that next day. And if you have that long day of 16 hours, um, that's gonna mean a, a late start in the morning for your drivers. And then uh, when we're talking about that 70 hours and seven days, 80 and eight, that could be reset once your driver has that 34 consecutive hours off. So basically, you know, you, you have a, you know, a typical, you know, long work week with construction, but then um, you get rained out for a, a day and a half or so, a couple of days, whatever, that could automatically trigger a reset if your drivers are off for that 34 hour period. And then you'd start over on that 70 or 80 hour rule. <clears throat> Um, basically, um, 
you know, the record of duty status and uh, is a requirement that uh, you have records for your for your driving time, whether it's time records or the record of duty status. And, um, you know, obviously you can't make false reports um, to falsify your driving records. Drivers can be declared out of service roadside if we stop a vehicle for a random inspection or, or some other violation and we check those hours of service regulations. If a driver is exceeding the maximum amount of time in uh, 327.03 um, or they do fail to carry their record of duty status is required, they could be taken out of service until they're in compliance, which in a lot of cases would be a 10 hour, um, 10 hours off. Uh, time records and, and uh, record of duty status documents are required to be kept for six months. And then the driver has to um, possess seven consecutive days in their possession and available for inspection while on duty if they are stopped and they're using record of duty status um, record for their, for their time, I guess. Um, so basically, if they're using a record of duty status, they need to carry seven consecutive days with them, uh, plus the day. So today and the previous seven. <clears throat> when uh, we're talking about hours of service in Wisconsin only, so in trust aid operation, uh, those regulations only apply to vehicles over 26,000 pounds. So if you have a, a service truck or something like that, and you're under that, uh, your 26,000 pounds or less, and you're not hauling placarded amounts of hazardous materials, or you have, you know, that passenger limitation of, of 16 and 15 and plus a driver. Um, if you have those small vehicles, you would be exempt from hours of service regulations. Now, remember, if you cross over and have drivers that go interstate, then those vehicles from 10,001 pounds on up do require compliance with federal hours of service regulations. <clears throat> okay, now talking about chapter 348, um, the size, weight, and load. Um, basically, all the roads in Wisconsin are Class A roads unless their post is Class B or they have a special or seasonal weight limitation to them. So basically, no person on a Class A road can operate a, a vehicle uh, with a single axle more than uh, 11,000 pounds on one side of it. So typically you have 20,000 on a single axle, no more than 11,000 on one side of that axle. And we talked about the, you know, generally 20,000 on a single axle. Talking a tractor trailer unit, uh, you cannot exceed 13,000 pounds on the steering axle unless uh, the tires and axles are rated for something higher and that can be up to 20,000 pounds. <clears throat> there is a weight chart out there, it's SP4075. Um, that is included as well with the uploaded documents, but um, you can simply Google uh, like Wisconsin DOT and SP4075 and you can find that easy enough online. Uh, when you use this form though, just make sure there's a couple different charts on there. If you look at the top, one, one will show a combination of vehicles and the other will show um, vehicles not in combination. So just make sure you're in the right one. <clears throat> um, basically, the way this works in that document, there's also instructions on how to use this and, and how to measure vehicles. But you're going to measure from center to center uh, between axle groups. Look at that chart between distances and the number of axles and that will tell you what the weight is that you're allowed to carry. Uh, we do allow you to round up one time on the measurement. If you're six inches or more, you round up five inches or less that gets uh, truncated or dropped off. But you can only do that rounding one time per measurement. Um, if you have accumulation of snow, mud or dirt, that is part of your load. So there is no extra allowance if you go through a snow or, or ice storm. Um, to get extra weight. Obviously, you know, if um, we're in the middle of a blizzard, uh, we're not going to be out there weighing trucks anyway. We're going to be out there riding crashes and, and 
you know, dealing with a different aspect of the job. So um, I think a lot of this plays more into play, you know, that follow up after the storm. If you're coming from out of state through a blizzard and you get to Wisconsin the next day and you're still, you know, coated with ice and snow from the prior day, then, um, you know, there'd be some concerns there. But, um, you, know, you know, there is some discretion in, in that the officers have in regards to that. But just have the understanding that in the statutes, there is no exception for this that actually specifically states that this does apply to your load. <clears throat> so what you do is you measure from center to center to axle. So if you were looking at this truck here and wanted to get the gross weight, measure from center of the first axle to the center of the third axle. Um, look at that distance at 12.6 it shows for the length. Um, you'd round that up to 13 feet and look at the chart for a three axle vehicle at 13 feet and tell you what that weight would be. Um, we use, do use uh, portable scales and stationary scales uh, to weigh these vehicles. And um, those readings are admissible in court. Um, the big thing that, uh, you know, push axles, they're a wonderful thing. You can haul a lot of extra weight with those trucks with tags, but you got to remember um, you have to be careful with them too, because they can cost you some money and, and fines if you don't know how to use those properly. Um, there is a requirement that each axle has to carry at least uh, 40 or 8% uh, of the gross weight. So in this case, this truck say it was 36,000 in the back end on the last drive axles, 4,500 on that pusher, 17,500 on the front. What that tells me, if you crunch those numbers and add up that gross weight times it by 8%, uh, that 4,500 is not enough weight. So that would not even count as an axle. You just went from a four axle vehicle to a three axle vehicle. The other problem in regards to this would be looking at the weights of that drive axle. You got two axles, probably four feet, six inches apart, something like that. You're allowed 34,000. Um, it's at 36,000. So that would be a violation as well. If you're on a class B highway, then um, that's basically would be some of your uh, lower classification roads, town roads, county roads, city streets and village streets. If it's posted with a class B sign, you actually get 60% of the weights authorized um, on the class A highway. There is an exception to that. So if you are picking up or delivering directly on a class B highway, um, you are exempt from that requirement, but it has to be directly from a class A onto the class B you're picking up or delivering from. You could not operate on a, on a class B highway to get to a second class B highway where that um, pickup or drop off site is. You also have to be aware, especially at this time of the year, now we're getting close to that time frame where special or seasonal weight limitations will come on. Um, these are your you know, spring posted roads. It could be a posted bridge, um, anything like that. Those you have to follow those signs and regulations. Uh, 340-175, that's a frozen road law. So if any of you haul uh, salt for winter maintenance, there are some extra allowances at certain times of the year um, when the roads are frozen to get some extra weight. And I know from just my experience, I, I hear comments from the trucking industry about, um, you know, the, the loads that some of the dump trucks in the, in the uh, fleet from highway departments, what they're carrying for weight. Um, I can tell you that they are exempt from weight limitations when they're actively removing snow or plowing the roadways or treating them. Um, but they are the same as you when it comes to the summertime and they're just doing their normal jobs of hauling materials for a construction site. And um, we certainly do uh, you know, police that as much as we do the private industry. So um, rest assured that they do have to comply just as your companies do. Um, if you are stopped for an overweight violation, you um, the officers do have the authority to to stop you for uh, stop a vehicle they believe is overweight and require that driver to weigh. That includes following them to a scale or driving onto our portable scales at a location. Um, and then they also um, 
have the authority to require you to offload uh, before you're allowed to continue. Um, there is discretion to, that we have with that as well, uh, where if you're uh, real close to a job site and it's safer to continue there, they may allow you to continue, but um, they do have that authority to make you offload it on site at a you know safe place if um, they seem that is the most appropriate course of action. Um, as far as the um, the scale facilities, if you're on the interstate, you do have to pull into the way stations when you're directed to. Um, if you do receive a citation because of an overweight, those are generally issued to the carrier, um, not the driver. Uh, but the driver um, ha will accept the citation to forward that on to the carrier. There may be times where the driver does get that citation, depending on the circumstances, but that would be uh, uh, kind of not um, not a normal situation. We do have what's called a reload law in Wisconsin. Uh, so basically, if you're if you're legal on gross weight, but you're over by 2,000 pounds or less on an axle group, if you can make that unit legal without offloading, to um, you know make it legal, get a warning, and go down the road um, without that citation. If you decide or you cannot reload it uh, to make it legal then you could accept a citation. Um, if you're your call, you can request a citation and then you can go down the road without uh, moving that load and you'd get a pass on that 2,000 pounds or less for that trip. But you would be received that minimal citation. Um, just to give you some idea on some of the poundage, um, it's you know, anywhere from two cents up to uh, 18 cents a pound for certain violations. Legal with 8.6, unless you have a permit or some other statutory allowance, which allows you to go more than that. 13.6, your standard height. And then there's no overall length limitation for a tractor trailer unit uh, when you're operating on a designated highway. The limitation though, is that you cannot be more than 53 feet with a with the trailer itself. There are some roads which, um, you know, if they're not designated, you have length restrictions. Um, in regards to the 53 foot semi trailer, uh, you have to be within 43 feet from the kingpin to the center of the last tandem axles. Uh, nothing longer than that. Uh, and the purpose of that is just obviously for tracking your own corners and so forth with those long vehicles. The length of a trailer is determined by measuring from the front of the trailer, so the very front of the trailer, to the end of any semi-trailer trailer or the cargo, whichever is longer, which sticks out the back. But we don't count air deflectors or refrigeration units. So if you have a reefer unit, we don't go to the front of the reefer, we go to the front of the actual trailer, not the refrigeration unit. And then on the back of a trailer, we'd go to the back of the load um, or trailer, except for like those aerodynamic, um, type uh, wind jams that, that go on the back or air deflectors. There are maps out there that show designated highways where you can go with those 53 foot long trailers. And likewise, there's maps as well that show restricted roads, which only allow 60 foot, 65 foot maximum length and only 48 foot trailers for the maximum length of a trailer. And um, basically those are maps on the DOT DMV website as well. There is a new automated oversized overweight permitting system. Um, basically, you can go on and, and obtain your own permits in most cases, but you have to make sure that the permit allows for the commodity you are hauling. Just because you have a permit in your hand doesn't mean it's going to be legal for the load you're hauling. So um, again, make sure the permit is for the commodity that you're hauling. Some things are not allowed to be hauled on a divisible load permit or non-divisible load. Um, and then make sure all your permit conditions are met. Uh, otherwise, your permit is not going to be valid if you aren't flagged or signed properly, or if you're operating during hours of darkness and you don't have the appropriate lights. 
uh, load securement issue is the only thing I have here is that we don't have a tarp law in Wisconsin, um, but you cannot allow any debris to blow off your truck. So um, depending on the material hauling, you might have a, a tarp on it. Um, otherwise, if it's not blowing off, you don't need the tarp. If you're hauling you know, stumps and large debris, um, you do have to have a tailgate or a comparable end gate for all the items hauled. So you can't just uh, pull up the end gate and drive down the road with a load in the back of that dump box without any type of end gate. Uh, again, check your drip pans for rocks or other materials before you're leaving your job site after you dump because uh, we get a lot of complaints from passenger cars about those rocks rattling off that drip pan and taking out windshields. I'm sure probably a lot of you have had those calls as well from, from citizens with passenger cars. If you're hauling heavy equipment, uh, just re remember that anything over 10,000 pounds requires a four point tie down system. Any hydraulic accessory has to be lowered, uh, lowered down and secured. Um, and then the other thing that if you have something articulated that that has to be secured at the pivot point, whether it be you know a tie down system or some manufactured uh, safety pin type of mechanism from the manufacturer. Interstate operation is, is um, anything which uh, takes you outside the state of Wisconsin. So if you have a load coming from one point in Wisconsin to another point in Wisconsin, but you decide you're close to the state line and you can take a four lane on the other side, um, that is now considered interstate operation, even though the destination and origination started in Wisconsin. Um, you went outside the state, so that's interstate commerce. If somebody hauls a load in that originates out of state and uh, you pick it up in, in Kenosha and take it to Madison, um, your leg, which is intrastate, uh, is still also considered interstate commerce because the load was uh, originating out of state. LC authority, that's for hire uh, authority for operating in Wisconsin only and hauling somebody else's product, while the MC authority um, is for operating in interstate commerce, hauling products uh, across state lines. And then when it comes to for hire authority, um, there are there is no 30 year mile reciprocity agreement. Uh, some of you may work around uh, some states that have a 30 mile reciprocity for registration fuel tax. Um, not every state on our borders um, has an agreement such as that. But even if you do, when it comes to for hire authority, there is no reciprocity agreement for authority, nor is there a reciprocity agreement for operating in interstate commerce or intrastate. It's because state line um, in commerce, it is interstate commerce, period. No reciprocity agreement for that 30 miles. Um, UCR, I just threw this in there that if you do operating interstate commerce, remember to comply with the UCR requirements. Um, it's just an added fee that you have to pay. It's uh, based on the size of your fleet and you do that online at this website here. Uh, we talked about this stuff already. Again, just uh, kind of recap that the 30 year my reciprocity agreement does not apply uh, to states without the reciprocity agreement. It doesn't apply to uh, log books unless you're operating within that, um, you know, short haul exemption on the federal side. It doesn't apply to medical cards. You either need it or you don't. And um, then CDLs or restrictions, there's nothing that, um, that allows for any reciprocity agreement there. Um, if you're restricted to intrastate operation, that means strictly intrastate. And nor does the authority, as we spoke earlier, um, allow for anything in that 30 mile reciprocity agreement for authority. Um, so kind of started to talk fast at the end there. I knew we were getting close on time and wanted to have a little opportunity for some questions. So um, again, I mentioned early at the beginning, we started out with this motor carrier information line. And that's how I want to end this presentation with that motor carrier information line. And I really encourage you to use that whenever um, you have a question that you want answered. Um, I guess when it comes to motor carrier regulations, they are complicated. There's a lot of exemptions and exceptions to regulations. And I would just say to be careful on when you ask a question, who are you asking that question uh, to? 
Um, I use, use the comparison that if I have a heart condition, I'm not going to go to a doctor or chiropractic. Now they're a doctor, but they probably don't know a whole lot about a heart condition or would I trust them with that problem. Likewise, with trucking regulations, uh, local law enforcement and state patrol troopers, um, they have a lot of expertise in their given areas. Um, but when it comes to truck law enforcement, unless they have special training, which there are some local agencies that do put them through our training, um, they're, they're, it's best suited if you talk to a state patrol inspector um, or a state patrol motor carrier sergeant or a lieutenant, something in that environment that works with this stuff day in and day out because we are the experts in the motor carrier enforcement uh, area for regulations. So with that, again, thank you for attending the presentation today. And um, we have a few minutes for questions, but I'll uh, shove this back to the moderator. Yes, thank you so much, Bill. Yeah, it looks like we've got a couple of questions. And just a reminder, everyone, please be sure to type your questions into the question box on your control panel. Uh, let's see. Okay, our first question is, who is required to provide the entry level training? So who is required to provide that training? Um, basically, anybody that's qualified to conduct that training could be, uh, is able to give that training. And that sounds kind of silly, but it's as simple as that. There is a federal registry though, which is probably the answer you're looking for. Um, if, you, if you go to uh, the FMCSA website or just simply Google FMCSA and um, entry level driver training registry, that will bring up a list and it breaks it down by state of who is all available to give that training within your state. And that would be the best way of, of finding out, uh, you know, who is out there close to you that can give that training. Um, there are a lot of companies <clears throat> that actually are offering the training in-house themselves. They, you do need to be in this registry though. So you would submit that application to FMCSA to be uh, licensed or registered to conduct that entry-level driver training um, class in-house and you'd be good to go. Uh, hopefully that answered that question. All right, wonderful. And then I've got another question. Um, not sure that they heard correctly. If there are no defects, uh, no written required, is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. So that's referring to the daily inspection report. And if I remember correctly, it was back in 2014, there was a change. Uh, prior to that, anytime you did a daily inspection report, it had to be in writing. Um, now, since that 2014 date, you still are required to do your post-trip and pre-trip inspections, but if there are no defects, then there is no need to complete the written report. But as I said in the presentation, if you do that inspection, you find a defect, it is required to do the written report, even if the mechanic is going to, you know, fix it within the next five minutes. Um, so then that would follow through that process of doing it in writing. Um, driver signs off on it on the post trip that there was this problem. Mechanic is going to sign off on it that they fixed it, even though it was just, you know, five minutes after the driver detected the problem. And then that next morning, um, there'll be the third signature on the pre-trip from that new driver that said, yep, everything's been fixed, no defects. I think the vehicle's in safe operating condition and um, a mechanic or company official certified that that repair was done from the issue that was detected last night, so to speak on the post trip. So um, kind of went over all that again, but I think it's good information. It's an area that definitely is, is misunderstood by the industry, um, but um, hopefully that will clear that up. Wonderful. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions from the attendees. I had kind of a quick one though on um, the uh, logbook um, for drivers. Now, I remember, uh, I think there were laws regarding switching paper logbooks to electronic, or are there still exceptions for using the paper logbooks? Yeah, there yeah, there were or is, and basically um, the session today we're talking about intrastate operation, and um, our hours of service regulations are governed by Trans Rule three twenty seven, 
and that trans rule has not adopted anything related to ELDs. So if you're operating strictly in intrastate operations, you do not need to comply with any ELD um, requirements. If you do want to use an ELD, you can, but it is not required. Gotcha. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Are there any last minute items that you wanted to uh, cover before we wrapped up or, or were you good? There's no questions of the audience. I don't uh, think I have anything else to add, but it is lunchtime, so the group is probably ready to <laughs> ready to head out to lunch. So <laughs> enjoy All your right. dinner. Sounds good. Well, thank you everyone for attending.